In this video, I'll be giving a brief overview on VH curves and how introducing an air gap can be advantageous for different power electronics applications. So consider the case where we need to create an inductor for this boost converter right here. We know that in a nutshell, the whole reason this DC-DC converter works is that when Q1 is closed and Q2 opens, uh, current flows through the inductor and energy is stored in the inductor. When Q2 is closed and Q1 opens, the energy from the inductor is transferred into the load. We also know that, along with the number of turns, IL plus delta IL determines the amount of energy stored. Um, so here's the inductor current here, where's the average along this point, and then it spikes up and down according to what we allow. Now, let's look at how the magnetic flux density through the inductor's core is affected by the amount of current we pump through the windings. So it's time to define some terms that may be confusing. Um, H here is the field intensity. It can be thought of as the amount of excitation we're giving to the inductor. Um, so here's our blown up inductor from this circuit here. That would mean the amount of current and turns that we have through this coil here that will uh, try to excite some flux through this core. Um, so the more H we provide, the more storage in the form of magnetic, uh, magnetic flux we expect to have. H is proportional to the current, turns, and how tightly spaced these coils are. Uh, the actual amount of magnetic flux is hard to measure, however B, or the magnetic flux density, is more manageable. Here we can see we're using the MKS units, which uh, is meters, kilograms, second, and uh, in this case, Tesla is the unit for magnetic flux density. And here is where drawing BH curves starts to come in handy. Uh, every time I've learned about them, there's always so much math that eclipses just how intuitive it is. So I'm gonna go pretty light on the math right now. Um, so here's the horizontal axis is the excitation, or H, and the vertical axis is the flux density, or B. Um, so this is as we excite a certain core material by putting current through the windings here, how much, how magnetized is it going to get? So starting off with a demagnetized core, we expect that as we put more excitation into the core, it'll become more magnetized. We're going to start to flip some of those magnetic dipoles and actually magnetize it. Uh, however, if we keep providing more excitation, eventually we're not going to get anywhere. There's going to be we're going to run out of those dipoles to flip and everything, and uh, we're going to hit the magnetic saturation point. So if we keep trying to provide more H, eventually the core cannot become any more magnetized. Uh, the maximum B is typically around 1.5 teslas for steel and might be about half a tesla for ferrites. Now assume we stop providing excitation to this core. So we stop putting any current through this, this coil around the winding and we start to ride back here. And we see that even when we're not applying any sort of current to these coils here, there's still some magnetism left. Uh, that's how permanent magnets are made here. And the amount of B that remains is called the remnants of that, that uh, material. Uh, so for a permanent magnet, you would want high remnants because you want it to stick onto your fridge without having to put a battery and some coils up to it. And in order to make the material demagnetize, we actually have to provide excitation in the reverse direction. So the amount of excitation we have to provide, this negative H, is called the uh, coercivity of the material. We can see that the same thing happens with reverse polarity if we increase H in the negative direction here. Uh, we eventually run out of dipoles to flip, and there's remnants here, and so on. Um, here the remnants is the opposite direction. So if this was uh, uh, magnetic flux in one direction, now if we excite it negatively and leave it, it'll be a magnetic flux in the opposite direction there. Uh, same thing, there's coercivity. We need to increase H positively now to demagnetize it completely, and, uh, and so on.
And this loop is called hysteresis. And the area of the hysteresis loop is indicative of how much energy it wastes to keep demagnetizing and remagnetizing. Uh, in our case, we ride this hysteresis curve in order to store energy in the inductor. So we provide a huge current through this inductor and we want that to be able to store energy in here so we can use it and pump it out to the load and whatnot. Um, so something for a transformer, if this is riding 50 or 60 hertz, the losses in here might be acceptable. But for power electronics applications up to 100 kilohertz, you would definitely want something with a really small area because you're gonna be wasting energy every time you flip polarity through this hysteresis curve. Um, such materials that are easily, uh, that don't waste a lot of energy are called soft magnetic materials. Conversely, uh, materials with a large coercivity and remnants are called uh, hard magnetic materials. Permanent magnet, you would want a large remnant so it stays on your fridge better, right? Um, but for power electronics applications, you actually wouldn't, you would want the smallest remnants, coercivity, hysteresis possible. So why do we need an air gap? So let's go over to these hysteresis curves here. Uh, adding an air gap does not lower the saturation of the core's material, but it does lower the magnetic permeability. So the slope here of B over H is something called mu. And mu is uh, indicative of how much magnetic flux you get for a given amount of excitation here. So here, if we, uh, for air, mu is really tiny. It's one of those universal constants you've probably heard about. Mu naught is uh, 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th. Uh, so we can see something like steel would be thousands of times more permeable than mu, than uh, air rather. So you get way more storage, if you would, uh, than air. That's why a lot of inductors have magnetic cores. So let's go back to the original circuit. We see the current through the inductor with this graph. This can be thought of as the H through the core. So if the design of the circuit allows for a large current ripple, that means H through the core will be large. Looking at the hysteresis curve for the core without the gap, we see that if this is our max excitation with this current ripple, we'd be well into saturation with this current ripple. And that's bad because we wouldn't get the expected storage we are, were looking for. Uh, but if we look at the curve with the gap, we can see that with our maximum excitation, we're still in this linear region here where we're uh, storing as much as we're expecting. So if we add the air gap, we allow for more storage of energy in the core before it reaches saturation. And adding the gap also adds reluctance, which means for the same magnetomotive force, uh, we get less flux. Um, this also means that the air gap reduces the inductance, since you can kind of think of it as the amount of flux you get for a given current. Um, so to increase the flux again, you can just add more turns into the original, uh, original inductor here. Um, and yeah, that's what I learned today about the air gap. So please leave any questions below. Thank you.